Aloha everyone and thank you for joining the COVID-19 Public Health Action Webinar, How to Communicate About Vaccination. My name is Stephanie Moyer and I am the Community Initiatives and Training Coordinator with HiFi. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some Zoom housekeeping. For all questions, please utilize the chat box or questions and answers box located at the bottom of your screen. We are not offering continuing education credits for these webinar series. And lastly, all webinars are recorded and will be available on the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui's YouTube channel. It is my honor to introduce you to our speakers today. First, we'll have CJ Johnson. CJ is the NHPI Filipino COVID-19 Outreach and Public Health Education Specialist at the Hawaii State Department of Health. His focus is developing community partnerships to ensure that the department's in-language COVID-19 outreach and education is timely, accurate, and informed by community needs, and that trusted community leaders have access to the information and resources they need to engage and inform their communities and constituents. Our second speaker today is Malia Lehua Ball. Malia is the Tobacco Cessation Program Manager of the Health Promotion at Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center. She has been, at y has been a Waianae resident for over 20 years and has held various positions in healthcare over, for over 25 years, ranging from RNA to program management. Malia is certified as a tobacco treatment specialist through the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and has a national certificate in tobacco treatment practice. She has provided tobacco cessation services in the Waianae community for over seven years. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to CJ. Hi, everybody. You see my screen there? I'm going to mute my camera because I'm going to be looking off axis, so it'll be easier for me if I'm uh, not watching myself look off to the side. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I am CJ. I'm with the Department of Health. Uh, I have spent a lot of the last couple of uh, the last year or so um, sharing FAQ style presentations and having conversations about vaccines and vaccine safety. I, I put a lot of effort into presenting in an accessible and engaging way. You've probably seen me over the last year. I've been uh, out there a lot, but it was mostly previously about trying to keep up with our rapidly changing FAQ information. But over the last couple of years, things have changed. Or, I keep saying you're sorry. I keep, over the last couple of months, things have changed a lot. And I've been doing something a little bit different, and I wanted to start with an exercise. Um, don't worry, it's not like a, I'm not going to call it anybody. It's not one of those exercises, it's just sort of a personal reflective exercise. I want everybody on the call uh, to think about a time in your life when you realized and had to admit that you were wrong about something important, something that meant a lot to you, something that you were invested in. Was it something at work or maybe something with a partner or a parent? And now I want you to think about the process of coming to terms with that change of heart. It didn't happen in the heat of a confrontation, did it? It was probably after the confrontation. Uh, a confrontation probably made it harder. Maybe later that night, maybe the next day, maybe five years later, the doubt started to creep in. And then even when you were pretty sure that you'd been wrong, that's not the end of it usually, is it? Because admitting to ourselves is one thing, but admitting to our community and to our families that we've been wrong is a completely other. So what makes it easier? Who are the first people that we tell to test the water? Is it the people who don't judge us and make us feel ashamed? Is it the people who listen empathetically? When I engage, my hope is uh, that at the end of every presentation or conversation, people that I'm engaged with feel more confident, uh, feel more engaged, feel like they have the information that they need to make challenging decisions. We are still reaching thousands of new people every week with our vaccine events. We are nowhere near out of people who are uncertain, who are confused, who are responding, who will respond uh, to patience and to empathy and to good science. Increasingly, the challenge is who they will respond to. Whether you're a community health worker or a teacher or a faith leader or a coworker or a neighbor, you have someone in your life who is concerned and needs not just facts, but clarity and confidence. So what I wanted to do is put together a presentation to share some of what I've learned about being a better, more confident public health ambassador around vaccines 
whatever your level of experience or, 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 or competence with the material. So uh, we're all pretty easily influenced, not just by evidence, but also by our cultural and social relationships. And increasingly, thanks to the pandemic, by technology. And you can't start to engage until you really consider all of those and how they interact to form belief. So I will get to the myth busting, I'll get to the evidence uh, and how to find it. But I wanted to start a little bit with connecting. This is my dad, Dr. Joe. Uh, he retired last year after 40 years in practice. That is my nephew, Owen, with him on the right. Uh, dad was one of the last of the old school independent family docs who didn't work for a big system or a clinic. Some of my earliest memories are accompanying him on rounds at nursing homes and hospice. And throughout my youth, I could not leave home without running into someone who could not wait to tell me that Pops had saved their life or that he was there in a loved one's final moments and how much that meant to them. And that made a really big impression on me. I worked in hospitals as an educator for many years. This is my employee of the month parking spot at McKee Medical Center in 2008. Uh, I work in public health now because I believe that healthcare doesn't just mean treating sick people. Uh, first and foremost, it has to mean building healthy communities. So I work with community leaders and I work with scientists and I work with leaders to help communicate with each other. And in emer emergencies, it can be really challenging to ask busy people to slow down and better explain complicated science, but it's really important that we do so. Because belief is rarely only about facts and data and debunking. It's usually about culture and relationships because why we believe and who we believe usually precedes what we believe. If you want to, it's really easy to find articles and videos and Instagram posts about myth busting, if that's all you're interested in. We can myth bust all day, but unless we're also engaging, in addition to myth busting, we're limiting our reach and we might even be doing harm. Because the thing to remember about disinformation and conspiracy theory is that it is purpose built to validate people who feel unheard and feel alienated. And when we talk about encouraging people to make evidence-based decisions, we have to remember that for a lot of people, the government and our institutions care more about my productivity than they care about my long-term health is an evidence-based proposition. There are so many stories behind people's distrust of the state and of our healthcare system. And it is impossible to have real conversations about vaccine confidence without understanding that trauma and that culture and that history. So we have to be prepared. We have to understand not just our own facts and our data that support vaccines, but also the background of people's concerns and the background of disinformation. There's really good resources out there for tracking uh, the emergence and evolution of disinfo. I highly recommend Public uh, Health Communications Collaborative at publichealthcollaborative.org. They have a great database on the origins, uh, clarifies common misinformation and has suggested strategies on uh, engagement with, with various kind of memes that are floating around and pieces of disinformation and how to engage with them more effectively. Uh, it's also really important to avoid framing talking points as rebuttals or debunking. We can't just nope people or invalidate people's beliefs and expect them to respond positively. Most misinformation starts with a seed of truth. It's been either misunderstood or has been deliberately manipulated. And we need to think of engagement as a chance to replant that seed in a healthier place. Myth busting, if that's what we're doing, repeats and centers misinformation and asserts a counterpoint. It's reactive, it's defensive, and it's negating. Storytelling, on the other hand, is one of our great strengths as humans. And storytelling is about agency. It's about people taking action. It's about overcoming challenges. It uses metaphor. It ties together the personal and the historical. The same information can be presented in both cases that I'm sharing here, but in one, people like listening to stories and they're better at listening to stories than they are at being explained at. So I think there's always value in doing that. And I'll go through some stories in a little bit. And next, this is such a complicated topic it can be really challenging to distill it to accessible information without losing important context and details. But if you choose your words, if you repeat key phrases, if you avoid jargon, you avoid blame words and use if then propositions rather than pointing fingers or making declarations, you can make it a lot further. Most of the data and information I share here is available as, as, as data and information at our website, hawaiicovid19.com or linked from there. It's a really great website. We update it really regularly. We have data dashboards. 
printable guidance, translations into 20 languages, maps of test and vaccine locations, safe travels info, school guidance, home care information if you have to stay home because you're sick. Uh, we update it frequently. You can subscribe to get regular updates so that you don't miss anything. We're also really active on social media to give you the latest updates. So there's places to get that good information. Uh, before we get to the disinfo, I, I do want to take a step back, though, and kind of and just give a little bit of a primer. And, and maybe you know this, and, and maybe you don't, but I don't want to assume anything because it's all it kind of all builds on um, what a virus actually is, right? A virus is a piece of genetic code that replicates by entering and hijacking a host cell. I'm so sorry. Um, and it's a virus is a piece of the genetic code that replicates by entering and hijacking a host cell and using that cell's proteins to create copies of itself and spread out in search of more cells to hijack. Because viruses use host cells to replicate, every time a virus jumps from person to person, it creates a variant by mutating. Most of those mutations don't change the way the virus behaves, but every once in a while, a mutation will make a virus more contagious, more severe, or more resistant to our defenses. Sorry, it keeps advancing automatically. I have to fix that. Um, because they use our, uh, because viruses use our host cells to replicate, every time a virus jumps from person to person and mutates to create the variant, most of them don't change anything. Uh, but every once in a while, a mutation makes a virus more contagious, more severe, and more resistant to our defenses. When any of those things happen, a variant becomes a variant of interest. Then, it, it starts outcompeting other variants. We call it a variant of concern. The more transmission occurs, the more likely a variant of concern will emerge. Viruses spread exponentially. In the case of the first identified strains of COVID-19, we saw transmission rates of each infected person infecting three more. And exponential growth expands very quickly. So those three very quickly turn into nine, which gives you 13 total infections in just two generations. And that chain continues, right, in an entire population. Whereas with the Delta variant, variant uh, we're looking at a factor of eight. So that means that just two generations that would have previously resulted in 13 infections now, report, now result in over 70. I heard a specialist refer to it as the difference between getting honey stuck on your fingers and getting gorilla glue stuck on your fingers. Increasingly, the data is also suggesting that in addition to spreading more readily, the Delta variant might cause more severe illness than previous that variants in unvaccinated people. So human history is the story of pandemics. One thing that researchers understand is that pandemics are when, not if. They are inevitable. Many times they reshape cities and regions and even the course of human history. There is dedicated research community that studies pandemics and has been working for centuries to make better and safer tools to reduce the suffering and social upheaval they cause. They shift through the ashes, ashes excuse me, of previous pandemics and near misses and use that calm between to prepare for what is always coming. And because they've been so deadly to humankind over the centuries, vaccine science is one of the oldest and most widely studied branches of science. Scientists have known about vaccines longer than they have known about hand washing before surgery. Uh, you probably heard the expression an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's the principle here. Even against the Delta variant, current vaccines are still uh, uh, extremely effective at reducing infection, reducing serious illness and death. You may have heard that vaccinated people with breakthrough infections can still spread COVID-19. That is true, but it's incomplete. First, they're dramatically less likely to get uh, COVID in the first place. And those who are contagious uh, are much less contagious for, uh, excuse me, are contagious for a much shorter time than unvaccinated people. Two of the currently available vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, are mRNA vaccines. mRNA was first identified as a potential way to improve vaccines in the 60s. This goes back to the 60s. mRNA or messenger RNA is just that, it's a messenger. It delivers instructions to our immune systems to give a head start in fighting new threats. So think of it like a photo of a virus's weaknesses that your immune system studies to better prepare itself. mRNA vaccines don't contain any elements of the actual coronavirus or any other virus. And, and we've known from decades of study that mRNA breaks down and is flushed out of our systems within days of delivering its message. It doesn't interact with our genes or cause long-term side effects. Your uh, chances of catching COVID from spending time near a vaccinated person are still much less than your chances of catching it from an unvaccinated person. But for now, the best policy for everybody, vaccinated or unvaccinated, is the same as it was a year ago, 
outside of your home, assume that you might be contagious, assume that people around you might be contagious, and take appropriate hygiene and preventative measures, uh, including masking around people outside your household, avoiding crowds, avoiding close contact with strangers, and get vaccinated. One of the most important parts of monitoring drug safety is tracking adverse events. And since 1990, uh, we have used a system called VAERS. VAERS is a database to track adverse events occurring after receiving a vaccine. It's a database of information submitted by individuals and healthcare providers. However, it is really important to remember that adverse events are not the same as side effects. This is the huge point of misunderstanding. Over time and with large groups, vaccinated people and unvaccinated people are both gonna have strokes and they're both gonna have heart attacks and other adverse health events occasionally. And to better understand the difference between adverse events and side effects, I like to use seatbelts as an example. So let's imagine if instead of vaccines, you wanted to look at whether seatbelts were safe and effective. Well, it turns out 11,000 passengers are killed in car crashes in 2019 while wearing seatbelts. Those would all be considered and reported as adverse events if they were tracked in VAERS. That's a lot of adverse events. But are they side effects? We don't have enough information to say. But if I also told you that another 11,000 passengers were killed in crashes unrestrained, then it doesn't look like dying as a, of in a car crash is a side effect of wearing a seatbelt because there's not an obvious increased risk, but is there a benefit? Well, we don't, still don't have enough information, right? We need to know how many people wear seatbelts routinely. And that answer tells you a lot because it turns out 90% of people wear seatbelts routinely. So if you do that math, it means that half of all passenger deaths are concentrated in that 10% of passengers who don't wear seatbelts. And what that means is even though there are a lot of adverse events, seatbelts appear to be very effective at reducing deaths in car crashes. The takeaway here is adverse events without any information doesn't tell you enough about safety to know if, someone is, if something is also a side effect. To do that, you need more information. And that additional information has told researchers that serious side effects are very rare and long-term side effects of vaccines are almost unheard of. On the other hand, we are learning more about the long-term side effects of COVID vaccine, uh, infection every day. And those include heart, respiratory, cognitive, sensory, sensory uh, neurological damage, even in younger people with mild cases. So again, our takeaway is vaccines are a critical prevention layer, just like seatbelts. I mentioned earlier uh, in the presentation that human history is the story of pandemics, right? One thing researchers understand is that they're when, not if. So research aimed at pandemic planning and preparedness and vaccines has been ongoing for centuries. So when someone asks, how did we get vaccines so quickly? The first part of that answer is we didn't. We've been creating and refining vaccines for ages. Even the makers of the current vaccines are quick to acknowledge their debt to history. Moderna CEO Uhur Sahin said, we did 20 years of research. We benefited from many years of other research and technology and know-how. This was an accomplishment for all of science and all of mankind. Trying to find a new medicine or a vaccine is like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's a painstakingly slow process. It's as much luck as science. In normal years, competing research and funding priorities mean hundreds of scientists are looking for hundreds of different needles in hundreds of different haystacks. But in 2020, COVID-19 was so dangerous that many more scientists focus on the same needle in the same haystack. And when your house is on fire, the fire department can come in without permission or a warrant. That doesn't mean that there's no rules. It means that there's special rules for responding to an emergency to help speed up the response without compromising safety. And we've heard a lot about emergency use authorization and the process that brought us emergency vaccines. But it was a carefully planned process that was developed years ago for emergencies exactly like this. And it's worked as intended, cutting through red tape to deliver safe and effective vaccine in time to save a lot of lives. And the last thing that takes a lot of time normally is the trials, right? Trials take a long time because it can take a while to recruit volunteers and because drugs take, some drugs take years to prove their effectiveness against rare or slow moving diseases. But COVID spreads very quickly and COVID-19 clinical trials got tens of thousands of volunteers immediately. And trials prov proved that the vaccines worked so well that it was clear very quickly that they did what they were designed to do. They reduced the spread of COVID and reduced serious illness and death. So if you put all of that together, the story it tells is not of cut corners 
or reckless decisions. It's a story of planners who put plan uh, put in place smart emergency plans that many, many people, from scientists to leaders to office workers to scholars to everyday volunteers of all backgrounds, work together on one of the biggest cooperative projects in human history. So onto another kind of virus. Uh, viral misinformation spreads just like viruses spread. Once it takes hold, it is sticky, it multiplies quickly, it mutates to become more contagious and harder to stop. And just like biological viruses, prevention is more effective than trying to minimize the damage once there's community spread. Facebook and YouTube are two of the most successful companies in the world. And the fact that they provide us a service for free while accruing historic wealth is worth thinking about. But what does it mean? It means that we're not the customers, we're the menu. It means that our attention, our fears, our anger, our outrage, our clicks, our likes, our comments and our shares, that's what they sell. And we don't even know who they're selling it to most of the time. But they don't make money feeding us facts. Novelty gets clicks. Curiosity gets clicks. They make money keeping us engaged. And the things that keep us engaged are outliers and curiosities. And we're not gonna reform Facebook anytime soon, but we can encourage better social media hygiene. When you see disinformation, don't engage, don't share, don't react. The algorithm doesn't care why you're engaging, just that you're engaged. It doesn't care if you're trying to argue and, and correct something. Um, use the report button, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But if you see misinformation that'll cause harm, the best thing that you can do is report it. But if you are engaging, you are amplifying, period. Uh, if it's not really easy on a site to see who wrote something or who the staff of the org that wrote it is, or if they use vague terms like a major new study or experts agree or a trusted university reported without actually saying who, be very skeptical and think twice before engaging or sharing. And this sounds obvious, but it actually matters a lot. Engagement is the currency of social media platforms and like it or not, uh, they have an outsized control over reality at the moment. You can't correct misinfo and disinfo by engaging with it, but you can seek out credible stories and engage and amplify them. Uh, Department of Health, HiFi, our partners work really hard to share evidence-based, easy to understand information. And your engagement, your support, your engagement with that helps it compete. It is an uphill battle anyway, but everything you can do to help really does try to cut through the noise a little bit. And if you choose uh, to listen today, if you're here, I, I imagine it's because you're frustrated with some of the things that you're seeing out there. You wanna help, you wanna get involved. It is really tempting to share snarky memes about how stupid people are, about how they're COVID idiots who don't care about their families and how smart we are because we're vaccinated. And those posts, uh, they get a lot of likes and a lot of reacts from our like-minded friends but it is not at all clear to me what they are accomplishing. I don't think we're gonna reach every skeptic or bad actor out there, but there are a lot of reasons and a lot of lived experience and a lot of culture behind people's beliefs and values. And we re when we reduce those to memes and we shame people, we're alienating them. For decades, public health has fought huge, sophisticated machines that profit by gaslighting us and by warping our reality. And again, we're not gonna fix that tomorrow, but we are not helping when we focus on shame over the systems that enable it. So if you wanna get angry, and I think you should be angry. I think we should all be angry, I'm angry. Let's get angry at the people who are profiting from the fear and the confusion and the misinformation. So I wanna close um, by addressing a common refrain during the pandemic. We hear a lot about trusting our immune systems uh, this is my dog, Ivy. Ivy eats street trash that would kill me because compared to hers, my immune system is feeble and pampered. She can't work the closures on her harness and she doesn't know my pin, so I still call the shots for now. There are entire countries where I can't drink tap water because of how inadequate my immune system is. There are people in my family who have to take pills every day because their immune system wants to kill them. All that is to say there are limits to how much I trust my immune system. If you took away anything today, I hope it's this, the, co the coronavirus, the COVID coronavirus replicates quickly, it adapts quickly, it mutates quickly, and it is invisible until it is too late. Compared to a lot of successful vertebrates, we are slow, we cannot fly, we have weak claws and teeth for hunting, and we have an extremely narrow temperature tolerance. And our immune systems are nothing special, they're nothing special. 
we have survived and thrived as a species by overcoming our physical limitations and our fragility with two big advantages. And they are the advantages that make us human in the first place. We make tools and we tell stories and we pass down tools and stories and we refine them and we make them our own. And we make them reflect the places we're from and the times we live in. We don't cross oceans with our fins. We cross them with boats. We don't fly on wings, we ride in planes. And we do not survive pandemics with the strength of our immune systems alone. We survive them because of vaccines. It is almost impossible to overstate the magnitude of lives saved by vaccines over the centuries. The story of pandemics is the story of inevitable and catastrophic disruption. Plagues have brought humanity to its knees many times, but the story of vaccines is a story of cooperation, of selfless volunteers, of generations of inherited knowledge that is so much bigger than one government or one corporation. And we all have a story to tell. COVID-19 has reminded us how connected our stories are and how the past shaped us. We're nowhere near out of people who can reach, we have, who have stories and who wanna be heard, who might find comfort and inspiration in our stories if we tell them. And so I wanted to thank you for listening to my story today. Thank you so much, CJ. That was very well said. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our second speaker, Malia. Thank you. I'm just gonna go ahead and turn off my video so I can go ahead and um, look at my screen. So again, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk about what motivational interviewing is, and I'll talk about um, explaining some of the ways you can communicate to those who are vaccinated, vaccine hesitant. In our tobacco cessation program here at Wainai Coast Comprehensive Health Center, we use motivational interviewing techniques to drive the behavior change in a positive direction. I'm gonna talk about how I use motivational interviewing when getting my patients to quit smoking, as well as while I'm doing contact tracing here on the Waianae Coast. I use the different approaches that could be used for our vaccine hesitant communication, community members. I'm gonna start, start off by talking about behavior change. Oh, sorry, having one difficulty. Okay, thank you so much. So behavior change. People do tend to resist what is forced upon us, forced upon them. We can all agree that, agree with that. And they're more likely to support it when they help create it. So again, in MI, motivational interviewing, there are six stages of change. Um, what you do is you find out what stage of change they're in and go from there. First, there's pre-contemplation where they have no intention of changing. Contemplation where they have a problem. They know they have a problem, but change can be difficult. Determination, preparation. They wanna quit and they're ready to make changes maybe start NRT, nicotine replacement therapy. And the action is acting out the plan. And once they quit, they can maintain, maintaining their change for tobacco-free and their new behavior replaces their old. At times they do recur or relapse. So in our tobacco cessation program, I always tell patients that if you relapse, know that you can always come back and when you're ready, I let them know that no one is perfect and there is no limit on how many times you can quit. With any stage, it's important to meet the patient where they're at. 
So the spirit of motivational in interviewing is you can use it, um, remember the acronym PACE. Starting off with partnership, you're gonna build a relationship with the patient. So in regards to contact, contact tracing, when you're talking with them, let them know that, hey, I'm from the Waianae Coast, you know, I'm from your community, and I know what's going on in the community that Waianae Coast has the highest positivity rate for COVID, and I'm here to help you. Acceptance. Let them know, first thing off the bat, we don't judge, right? And again, meet them where they're at. Compassion. Letting them know that you care for their well-being. You care about them. You're not they're not just a number. Um, evocation, find out why they will or will not quit smoking or why they won't get vaccinated. And how did they come to that decision? So there's some processes for motivational interviewing, engaging, making sure you establish a connection with the patient. For example, myself, from the Waianae Coast and I say, hey, I'm from Waianae, where are you from? Once they find out that you're from Waianae, they will more likely want to be more divulging with information. Let them know that you're listening. Instead of having your back turned and you're on the computer typing, turn to them and let them know that I'm engaged, I'm listening. Focusing, let them talk and tell you what direction they, they're going towards. Again, if you're talking the whole time, you won't know what are their needs or what are their wants. Also, ask permission to give advice. While giving advice, you know, you're stating what you know to be right, but in the end, it's their choice. Evoking, what is your motivation? For example, find out how motivated the patient is to either quit smoking or to get vaccinated or not. Let the patient show their reasoning for change. Planning, encourage change talk. If and when the patient is ready, discuss a specific plan. Again, meet them where they're at. Change talk. It's any dialogue that favors movement and change, preferably to the direction that you're wanting them to go, either quit smoking or getting vaccinated. To remember change talk, you can use the acronym darn cat. One, the desire to change, ability to change, reason to change, and their need for change. Also, how they can be committed, how they can start activation and taking steps. What to look for to develop a behavior change? While you're talking desire, they're saying, I really want to get vaccinated or I really want to quit. Ability or for tobacco, I've done, I've done it before, reason. I will have more energy if I didn't smoke. Need, I can't go through life like this, I have to quit. Mobilizing change talk, commitment, I will quit, or I will get vaccinated. Activation, I'm ready and willing to make changes. Taking steps, and I'm taking specific actions to change. Sustained talk. It's any speech that does not favor movements in the direction of change. It's almost change talk and sustained talk is going back and forth. Desire, I really like eating desserts or I really like smoking. Ability, I don't see how I can give up sugar. Or I don't see how I can give up tobacco. Reason, I eat because I'm surrounded by a family who also eats hearty meals. Or I smoke because of my I'm surrounded by family who all smokes. Need, I don't like, excuse me, I don't think I need to quit. Or I don't think I need to lose weight. I don't think I need to get vaccinated. Commitment, I tend to stay, I intend to stay the way I am. Activation, I'm willing to do this or I'm not willing to do this. In sustained talk, there's no taking steps. 
because they made up their mind at activation, I'm not willing to do this. So it's the flip of the coin. If they give sustained talk, meet them where they're at. Again, the key thing is meet them where they're at. Discrepancy. If a patient says, I want to be a good role model for my children, but I don't see how I can give up smoking. Counselor, let's put aside the how to do it for right now and just talk about how you would like to think, you would like for things to be different. Again, discrepancy leads to ambivalence, hesitance. Again, communication methods, um, you can remember this by the acronym ORS. So when you're talking with the patient, Ask them open-ended questions. A is for affirmations. R is for reflections. And S is for summarize. In the open-ended questions, the benefits allow the patient to express themselves. Patient verbalizes what is important to them at the moment. Again, at that same, same note, the counselor's benefit is to learn more about the patient. Set a positive tone for the session. Some examples. Or how would you do that? What do you see as your biggest challenge? Tell me more about that. It is okay to ask closed questions when you want a specific answer. Affirmation. Help patients to overcome negative thoughts. Say you or your, don't say I. An affirmation could be, you really follow through when you put your mind to something. Some of the discouraged patients will say, I tried to quit 16 times. Um, you would respond, wow, you really showed your commitment to trying to stop smoking. More importantly, you're willing to try again. Make affirmations specific to the person. We want to see strength in themselves that what they forgot about them. Reflections. Reflections so show that you're interested. It's important for me to understand you. I want to hear more. What you say is important to me. It lets them know that they're just not, they're not a number. They're a person and you're interested in how they feel. Types of reflections. Repeating, rephrasing, paraphrasing, and reflection of feelings. So remember, reflections are the feelings. When you're repeating, you repeat an element of what the patient said. Rephrasing, you're gonna stay close to what they said, but slightly rephrase what they offered. Paraphrasing, you're gonna restate, infer what is said and then reflect back in new words. And again, reflection of feelings, you're gonna paraphrase emotional dimension. For example, what I'm hearing you say is, or it sounds like, to summarize, reflect components that will help the patient in moving forward. You care about your health and the health of your ohana. What can be used to gather more information? Uh, what else? Are there any other reasons you want to quit? It can also be used to move in a new direction. Now we can talk about, now we can talk about your quit plan. Now we can talk about you getting vaccinated. A brief intervention, we use illicit, provide illicit. What you wanna do is elicit, ask the patient what they know or what they would like to know. For example, what do you know about the effects of COVID-19? Provide, provide information in a neutral, ju non-judgmental fashion. So research suggests that versus you're putting your health at risk when you're not vaccinated. Elicit the patient's interpretation. What does this mean to you? How can I help versus it's obvious from this information that you have no choice and you must get vaccinated.
So again, when I am seeing patients in regards to tobacco cessation or when I'm calling patients in regards to contact tracing, I'm letting them know that I care for them. I'm using motivational interviewing. I'm finding out what if they're vaccinated and if they're not vaccinated, I'm giving them information. I'm letting them know what could happen to themselves, to their families, to their coworkers. And in the end, I do tell them vaccination is the best thing for you and the health of you and your ohana. But I do at the end of that, let them know that it is their choice. Thank you. Mahalo, Malia. So uh, just a quick reminder to uh, everyone on the webinar, if you haven't already done so and do have a question, please feel free to drop it into the chat box or the question and answers box. So first question that I will ask our presenters is, how can we have productive conversations with someone who deeply believes false information about the COVID-19 vaccine? And maybe we'll start with uh, CJ. What is your advice on that? Uh, I, I really tend to focus on more on the idea that there are, um, there's no shortage of people who are not entrenched. I think it is more useful to find, like I said it in, the, in my presentation, right? We are vaccinating tens of thousands of people a week. This laid into the campaign, right? I still engage five or six times a week. I do this a ton. And every time there's conversations and people ask questions that I've been answering for, you know, a year now. And, and, and I think from, a, from, a, from the perspective of those of us on this call, I think most of us are really plugged in and we follow, you know, we're high information and we're on social media and we read all the reports and stuff. Um, but I think that there's a lot of people that are, that are not as plugged in, who are not as entrenched on either side and you just have concerns. And so I think where our energy is probably best spent is those people, the people that are closest to us in terms of that availability and not worrying. And I think that's always been the case. And I said this in January, like, well, what about the people that, you know, this and this? I, I, I just kind of feel like if we get at the low hanging fruit, if we get at the people who are, who are um, available to us, who are in proximity to us, that's the best way to, to move the needle. And then we can worry about the, the holdouts when they're the only ones left, but we're not even close to that yet. So I just, it's not a place that I, it's not a place that I spend a lot of time other than I do like to, as I did in the presentation, I like to point out that a lot of them, um, a lot of the institutional leaders who have, who are stridently anti-vax have agendas and those agendas are not your best interest and they're not your health. And so um, in our broadcast messaging, we, we try to be clear about, the, you know, calling those agendas out. But in terms of like, you know, going, I don't go out and yell at the Aloha Freedom people. Like that's not, I don't think that's a good use of, of anybody's time. Malia, did you want to add anything to that? Like CJ said, um, you want to start with the people you know that, that are closest to you. Start with family and friends, let them know. I let them know you know, the dangers of um, not being vaccinated, what happens when you're not vaccinated. I share my personal stories about my family, my, you know, the whole family getting back, getting COVID or another family member getting COVID and you have someone in their house who's on chemotherapy. Just sharing these stories and letting them know, educating them in ways that they can understand. A lot of times, when you're, when you're talking with patients, they don't understand unless you explain it to them in a language that they can understand. And so, um, and that's what I do with my patients. Again, when you can share information that um, is personable and they're trusting, they trust you more instead of reading, listening on uh, Facebook or TikTok kind of information and they believe all of that but when it comes when it comes from somebody who you think is um respectable and knowledgeable um, they're more likely to um engage in what you're wanting them to do thank you um and that kind of touches on another question that we had is um 
you know, how, how to initiate those conversations. And so I, I think adding those personal stories is a, is a really great way of initiating them. CJ, did you want to add something? No, what was that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Nodding in agreement. Um, so the next question is actually for you. Uh, it's, um, is the Mu variant picking up speed with more cases in Hawaii? Uh, it was not as of the last variant report, which was two weeks ago. We should have a new variant report out in the next couple of days. They, we do it every two weeks. Uh, there's, it's available. The variant, we publish a variant report on, the, you can link, it's linked from hawaiicovid19.com. You go to data and trends, and then at the bottom of the data and trends dashboard, which is a great dashboard. If you haven't looked at it, you can look at all of the disease activity and vaccine rate by age, by, by zip code, by all these different things. Uh, at the bottom of that page is a variant report. And as of right now, I can actually pull this up real quick. Um, as of right now, this is our current variant report. And that uh, the orange there on the variant report is Delta. So statistically, at least, and again, these are samples, right? We don't have every single one, but statistically, uh, Delta is specifically 100% of our cases. And that's as of two weeks. I have not heard anything otherwise. Um, Delta appears to be really, really competitive. That's because it is, it, it is like I said, that sort of gorilla glue. Um, and it is, it is outcompeted the other strains really, really effectively just because of its combination of characteristics. So, so far, no, I have not heard any, I have not heard any alarm about Mu. Mu. Thank you. Um, next question is, what do you suggest when an unvaccinated person says that the mainstream data or information is a lie, that the truth is being hidden from us? Uh, I think that that's a longer, I think that that is going to usually be more than one conversation. I don't think there's a slam dunk answer that you can that you can provide that that flips the switch. Um, I I do think that you can start to ask, well, who who do you trust? Like where where what would it take? Who would you have to hear from to to change your mind? And I think that's a really challenging question. And, and also and as long as we're there, I think that's a question we should all be asking ourselves. If you know what whatever certainties we have what would change our mind or who would change our mind? Because I really, as I said in the presentation, I think that who we believe tends to precede what we believe. I think we make, we make post hoc rationalizations for our belief set based on social and cultural influencers. And so those are the places where where we focus is, is if there are, you know, if it's somebody that, that, is, that has no confidence in the mainstream media, I think there are academic answers. I think there are long answers in terms of um, the complexity of those systems uh, suggest, it, it seems like it would be really hard if you think through what a conspiracy would actually look like to, to suppress or inflate and they're contradictory. There's, oh, they're, they're making it worse than it is or they're making it less bad than it is. Um, the, there's not a lot of the mechanisms behind them don't don't hold up when you start to interrogate them, but I don't think you have to interrogate them. I think that probably working at the influencer level is, in my case, and I and I I loved M M Malia's presentation because she focuses a lot more on the personal interaction, and so I'm really curious to hear what she has to say. But I would say generally, I I just I, I focus on the influencers and focus on why people get to those beliefs because that's how we all make our beliefs up. Stephanie, I just wanted to go back to that second question you had. Someone had asked in regards to how do you approach, um, can you refer, can we say that question again? There was a second question. Um, sure. Um, the question that I had just asked, the second part was um, that people feel that the truth is being hidden from us. Mm -hmm. Oh no, the second question oh. you asked. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you suggest um, when an unvaccinated person says that the mainstream data or information is a lie, that question? Mm -hmm. No, one more before that. I think so. Okay. Um, uh, first question was, how can we have productive conversations with someone who deeply believes false information about COVID-19 vaccines? Okay. And just letting them know, again, personal experiences, um, what I do for some of the patients is, I think it was the other question, but in regards to how do you let them know about if what I do is I ask them if they're vaccinated or if they're not vaccinated. But how I get that is, for example, when I'm doing contact tracing, we have to ask if they're vaccinated or not vaccinated. And then from there, um, one of the questions is actually if they're, if they're a smoker. And so when they are a smoker, I'll go ahead and 
let them know the dangers of um, having COVID and being a smoker. So from that, I actually got several patients that are wanting to quit from giving that information. Also, um, in regards to um, my patients that I'm seeing here, I'm asking them, are they vaccinated? And letting them know, again, that they should get vaccinated, that that's the best thing for their health. So just, again, like he said earlier, trying to get the lower, your, trying to get your patients to understand um, the dangers and why they need to get vaccinated. So I think your answer did touch on um, another question that came in and um, this person works in a community health center and asks for the vaccination status and they want to know, um, is it appropriate and effective to ask why they're not getting vaccinated and then provide that information, even if it's unsolicited. So what are your thoughts on that? Okay, for myself, when I'm doing contact tracing, I do ask them if they're vaccinated or not. And if they say they're not vaccinated, and I say, um, first I ask them, I let them know that, oh, if you, you can still get vaccinated when you are out of isolation or quarantine, and to let them know that if they were to get COVID again, that their symptoms are much less if they're vaccinated and they have a, their transmission to someone else is less. And if they have any more questions, you know, we can answer that. Um, now, um, yeah, so I do give them information in regards to that. And, and again, when people say, no, I'm not getting vaccinated and I don't wanna get vaccinated. And I say, oh, okay, that's your choice. But if you do change your mind and have more information, give us a call. Yeah, I think that's, I agree. And I, I would just say, I think collecting is great, right? Finding out when, you know, when you're engaging, see, see what those sources are, because it's not all, you know, everyone has different relationships with the institutions. Everybody has different reasons of varying validity. So I think finding out why is really valuable and 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 i think the way that she said it is great like the way you go about it is can i help is there are you are you are you vaccinated no do, do you have any questions or would you like any you know any any if you need a map <laughs> i mean not literally but is there a way that we can support you making that decision and if people want to then yeah but it's great thank you um, next question is, do you have any experiences you can share about people who were hesitant but changed their mind about vaccination, perhaps after a conversation that you had with them? Yeah, I mean, a lot. I, uh, uh, I'll, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we've been doing this a ton. And I think especially in, um, especially in immigrant communities or low income proficiency communities, it is routine that um, we will do an event and just reach out to some faith leaders or some community leaders and um, make sure that we have accessible, you know, inter interpreters for accessibility. And we'll spend all night. I mean, I've done, I've done events that lasted four hours and everybody, you know, we asked their questions and we listened and we heard them. And we've had a ton. We've had people that were super proud and followed up and showed us, you know, pictures of them with their, with their bandage on their arm. So I think, again, the, the, the strategies that I shared um, are strategies that are based on doing this work a ton for the last year. Um, and they're, and they're not just us, they're, you know, their best practices, their national best practices and stuff, but it, it really does help to listen. It really does help to understand. It really does help. You know, every time I present, I might, I change up my deck a little bit based on what I learned last time. Um, so I, we've had a lot of successes with it and we continue to, and the goal continues to be, you know, reaching out and listening to communities and figuring out, listening to leaders and figuring out how to help them become more effective ambassadors. In doing contact tracing, and when the patients are unvaccinated and they actually got their whole family um, contracted COVID from that one patient and none of them are vaccinated, I do let them know that, again, they can still get vaccinated. And when I tell them that, you know, they're more reluctant. Now they're, oh, you know what? I can still get vaccinated. I said, yes, you can. And by that, letting them know and educating them 
you know, this gentleman was now going to get the whole family vaccinated. And so there's, you know, many stories, stories where even they're positive and they haven't got vaccinated and they're still not going to get vaccinated because they don't believe in COVID. So again, it's, and you just let them know that it's your choice, but again, if they're ready and when they're ready to have more, more questions, they can always call our hotline. Thank you. Um, this might be our last question we have time for. Um, recently, lots of folks are using historical trauma, which is real as a reason to not, excuse me, um, as a reason to not follow any safety guidelines. What are the best resources for Hawaii to show why following the safety guidelines is important? We work very closely with um, trusted cultural community leaders, in particular for Native Hawaiians. We work with Papa Olalokahi. Um, they have done a tremendous amount of work around sort of historical relationships between colonialism and, and vaccines and health guidance. Um, they've done a ton of webinars. They've created material. I, I highly recommend everything that they've put out as, as really valuable resources for those conversations. Other populations we've worked with, Filipino population, Marshallese, Micronesian, same thing. I think a lot of these partners are really thoughtful about how do you recommend file the fact that the state is not trustworthy with asking people to trust th this process and it is not easy but uh i think they have you know they have really good answers to that and i would encourage anybody who's interested in tackling that to to follow them or engage in some of the stuff that they're putting out so we do have time for maybe one more question um Ige has said that he'll loosen up restrictions once 70% of Hawaii's population is vaccinated. What can we do to keep on encouraging people to get vaccinated mm -hmm. after we reach that threshold? And how do we keep the momentum going? That's a good question. I, I think um, one of the big challenges that we've run into is, is creating this kind of series of, of moving goalposts. Um, and I think that was the, the, the justification or intent behind that was good, which is we want to, you know, people were feeling scared and hopeless and you want to give them a, a finish line. Um, but the reality has always been that the disease decides the finish line, not our, our metrics. And so we came up with the 70% number a year ago as in terms of this, I, you know, this kind of theoretical threshold for herd immunity. And the, the problem with that is that uh, that, that, that math is, was always a, a guess. And then on top of that, the math was based on the transmissibility of the original strains where Delta is much more virulent. So I think it's, um, I don't know what the messaging is gonna look like going forward, but I know that 70% is not, I mean, we're not, from my perspective, from our outreach perspective, we're not really talking about herd immunity anymore. We're talking about getting everybody vaccinated because this disease is widespread and is rampant and it's unlikely to be contained anytime soon. And you're, you're gonna run into it at some point and you're better off running into it vaccinated than unvaccinated. So that's the strategy. I don't know what the governor's doing, but for as a public health strategy, that's that's what we're saying. It's just, it is, is you are likely, and, and it is bouncing around the state. It is gonna bounce around the world um, and, and you're gonna get, you're gonna run into it. And so let's, let's get vaccinated and, and be ready when you do, because it'll be a lot worse for you if you're vaccinated. You know what I'm telling my patients and my family, it's not a matter of if you get it, it's a matter of when you're gonna get it. So it's best to get vaccinated. Thank you. So I think with just a few minutes left, um, we have some of the resources from CJ. Malia, do you have any good uh, website or resources that folks can visit uh, for more information on motivational interviewing? Oh, you're muted. I can go ahead and get that to you. Okay, so um, everything that has been dropped in the chat and what Malia sends us, we will be sure to send out to everyone in our Mahalo email. And I do apologize to uh, the folks that asked questions that we were not able to get to today. But I do wanna send a big Mahalo to Malia and CJ for being our guests today. Mahalo to everyone on Zoom for joining us. Um, lastly, thank you to all the Hi-Fi staff behind the scenes um, helping this run smoothly. 
Please save the date of October 6th for our next uh, public health action webinar. And until then, please be safe, be well, and we hope to see you then. Aloha. Mahalo.